Okay, great. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, the Private Equity and Venture Capital Club and Fordham's Accounting and Tax Society for um, our amazing event today with none other than Siddharth Singhai, which is the CIO of Iron Hold Capital. Um, this event is um, basically Sid giving us a seminar on value investing, and there's no one better to be showing us how to do it other than Sid. And um, I'd be really, really happy to let Jay and YL take it away from here. So. Yeah. Hi guys, I'm Jay and I'll just be giving a quick intro for Siddharth. So Siddharth, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule. We know you're really busy and I think you want to do this on a Wednesday night, but here you are Thursday. But so Siddharth comes from a non-traditional background. So he did his bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And then after that, he worked as a lead equity research analyst for Capital Waste Financial Advisors, where he applied value investing principles, which we'll be talking about today, to emerging markets of India. He's also researched in the Indian economy, has published in, in leading journals like in the Financial Journals, the International Journal of Multidisciplinary Research. He also holds a master's in global finance from Fordham and Cabell School of Business. He also has been featured in leading business journals like Forbes, Business Insider, Hedge Week, Value Walk, and Alpha Week. I'm going to let Sid take away from here. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here, you know, speaking to students of Fordham University. Thank you for inviting me. And I do have a presentation for you guys that I will pull up in a second. Uh, and, you know, I'll just go over some of the fundamentals of value investing, what it is, and, you know, we'll cover a whole bunch of topics related to it. Uh, these include what is investing in general, what is value investing, why you should invest for the long term, all of these value investor, how do you actually invest, what is margin of safety, and I'll give you guys an actual real world example of uh, go about it. So what is investing? Investing is making money from money. Essentially, we take our money, we deploy it, or we buy some assets. Assets could be anything, stocks, real estate, gold, silver, commodities, uh, like copper, uh, any of those things even Bitcoin or art pieces, you know, exotic luxury cars that are rare. And the goal of successful investing is to make money from these assets, right? Either through appreciation or through yield, which is really cash flow. But that is in general investing. Now, why value investing? Well, Value investing is, you know, a set of time-tested principles. It's been successfully applied by some of the world's greatest investors. So you can see Mr. Seth Klarman, Mr. Greenblatt, and the great Warren Buffett himself. Um, and it essentially uh, involves thinking of yourself as a business owner rather than somebody who's a stock trader or investor and buying something for less than what it's worth. Mr. Buffett would say, you know, I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman and I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. Essentially, you want to think like a business owner, not, you know, as if you're owner of some ticker that goes up and down in value. And this is what I mean by that. Stocks in the short run, as you can see that gray curve, uh, in this case, market price, um, they are inefficient or random. Can you guys hear me? Right, okay. So, you know, stocks in the short run are inefficient, which is to say stock prices are random. You cannot really predict them. And so any kind of technical analysis or you know, trend-based investing or investing based on very recent news is most likely to result in uh, 
not great investment returns. What you want to do is invest for the long run. Why should you invest for the long run? Well, in the long run, the quality of the business or the performance of the business rather and the performance of the stock is pretty much the same as you can see here. In the short run, the stock can do pretty much anything. Now, what is the performance of the business? Well, it's the growth and intrinsic value of a business. What is intrinsic value? Intrinsic value is all the cash flows that business will produce over its lifetime, 10, 15 years, discounted back to present time. That is the value of every business. And if you can buy for less than what that value is, which is right here, is underpriced, you know, when the stock is uh, temporarily depressed for any psychological reason out there. Um, that is where you build your position and then you hold on to it. Eventually, as we know, markets are efficient over long periods of time. Intrinsic value of the business and the market value of the business or the stock price essentially are going to be the same. So your job as a value investor is really to first of all figure out intrinsic value for business. And then, you know, the stock price is easily visible and you make a decision whether you want to uh, build your position or you want to cut your position if it's overpriced. So that's the nature of the market. And it's very important to understand. So compounding, right? What is compounding? Well, imagine having a snowball, right? A small one at the top of a mountain and you roll it off. What would happen over time is that that snowball will get bigger over time without you putting any effort into it, right? And same thing happens with your money. If you let your money, no matter how small the amount is, if you let it roll down the hill or essentially grow over time, let's say 20, 25 years, you don't have to keep investing a lot of money. You know, the time or the compounding of time, uh, that will take care of the amount that you will receive at the end. And this is a great realistic example uh, that explains that. You invest $2,000 monthly over 25 years and you assume a 9.14% or let's say roughly 10% return on your investment, which is not uh, extraordinary. It's the average you can expect. And initially you start out with $1,000. Over time, right, 25 years, that amount will be around 1.4 million, right? So the key is to start early. It doesn't matter if you start small, but you know, if you allow your money to grow over time, you don't have to invest very much. Right? $2,000 a month is not an extraordinary amount for a lot of working professionals. And 9% to 10% returns are what you can expect from your S&P 500 index if you just own that. So essentially you have to do nothing to make this money. You invest it and you let it grow. Now, you might ask, why long term, right? Why can't you break the short term? Or why should you, you know, go so patient and, you know, wait for the market to be efficient? Well, first, you know, it's almost unpredictable, the market in the short run, very few people are able to do technical analysis and actually make money in the market. And second, you know, if the economy is doing well, right? the market over long periods of time is gonna do well. And this is actually a good representation of that. We had a number of crises, you know, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Uh, 87 market crash, Mexican base of crisis, World Trade Center attacks, the mortgage meltdown, subprime mortgage meltdown, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and uh, COVID very recently. And so, as you can see, market is driven by psychology and people do get scared and they do, you know, respond negatively to these events, but 
as long as the underlying economy, in this case, United States is doing well, there's no reason why the overall stock market should. And this is a great example of that. So if you invest for the long run, short term events, you know, no matter how major they might seem in the moment, don't really have much of an impact. In fact, they're a great opportunity to build positions uh, in your favorite companies. So what's the psychology behind being a value investor, right? There are four things that you have to think about majorly. There are a few others, uh, but these are the, the big ones. You need emotional stability. You need patience. You have to say no to almost everything and you have to think in bets. Now, emotional stability and patience. You know, these are two great companies, Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon. But even then, you know, they did, you know, if you look at the stock price, yeah, they did go down by a lot during dot-com bubble, Great Recession, COVID-19. And, you know, if you got scared, if you were emotionally, you know, too driven by what other people were doing in the market, and uh, you did not have the calm or the guts to hold on to these stocks, you would actually sell at a loss, right? And so you need emotional stability. You have to have the facts and you make your decisions based on those facts. In addition, you have to wait, right? These things last for anywhere from eight to 12 months, depressions, recessions. And if you're impatient, if you want to make your money quickly, you will get punished for it in the stock market. And, but, you know, if you are wise, if you understand what the intrinsic value of Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway or any other businesses, you can come in at a price that's very attractive. That was available to you during these recessions. And you just hold on to these stocks and uh, you do well. So emotional stability and patience. And then the other qualities are more related to how you actually invest. So you have to think in bets, to say no to almost everything. The third is probably the most important one, have a margin of safety, right? Thinking in bets, right? We all take risks in our day-to-day -day life. You know, you go to the beach, you take you know, some risk. You can get attacked by a shark, right? The probability of that, as you can see, is extraordinarily low. You can get hit by lightning. That's also pretty unlikely. You know, car accidents are, you know, it's not that unlikely, but, you know, still that, take that risk. So that is, you know, the real world. Nothing is assured. You have to think in bets and you have to understand what are the odds of your success or failure when you invest in. So in, you have to find situations where the downside is limited and your upside is huge, it's exponential. And if you can do that with stocks and from time to time you do get the opportunities to do that, then you'll do well. So think in bets, right? What's my downside? What's my upside? And is it asymmetric? Second is, you know, let's say you're looking to get married and the millions of people out there that can be potential suitors for you. Um, how will you go about this, right? Marriage thing. You're gonna apply a set of filters. You're gonna look at a bunch of qualities that you desire. And based on that, you're gonna filter through hundreds of thousands of candidates. And then what would be left is worth further inspection, right? And same goes for stocks. There are over 3,700 stocks in the US. And you don't have to be right on, you know, even 1% of those. You need 15 great stocks and that's pretty much it. So in order to get to those 15, you have to say no to almost every other stock. And so you need good filters. Good filters will allow you to quickly sift through investment opportunities that are great and that are not so great. And that's why there's scope, right? Very successful people say no to almost everything. Makes a lot of sense. Lastly, you know, 
if you've ever noticed, right, uh, elevators have a limited capacity. You can only take maybe eight to 12 people at a time. But let's say you decide to do something crazy and you, know, you take 15 of your friends with you uh, on a capacity of 12. It wouldn't mean that you, know, you guys are gonna get injured or dry or, you know, there's not gonna be an accident, essentially. Reason for that is, you know, the engineers, when they were building out these elevators, knew that human beings are not perfect and they had already built in a margin of safety in advance. Take care of that. And that's what you want to do with your investments. In case you're wrong, you know, about your predictions of future cash flows, you want to buy things for cheap. So even if you are wrong, you know, you don't lose your principal. Same can be applied, yeah, you know, for when you're building bridges. You want bridges to hold, you know, twice as much as, you know, every everyday traffic, because, you know, weird things could happen. There could be intensity when the material might lose its, you know, uh, strength over time. And you have to account for all of those. And so you just take a big margin of safety. Well, this is a good example of, uh, an investment that you know we think will uh, that, that possesses all the qualities of a great investment. I should say. And full disclaimer: we do own positions, and so this is, should not be uh, construed as investment advice of any type. Um, that being said, Leo Corporation is a leading seat manufacturer in the U.S. Um, the three big metrics uh, that you will see on your screen. I see debt to shareholders equity, discount intrinsic value. What are those metrics and why are they important, right? ROIC is measure of quality of a business. And, um, you know, average business in, in the U.S. earns a uh, return on asset capital about 10%, 15% would be really good. Leo earns 40% and it's done so for a long period of time, well in excess of 40%. So it's a high quality business. It has net debt to shareholder equity of only 22%, which is almost no leverage. Now remember, you wanna have some leverage so that you are taking use of uh, the, the low interest rates that this is right now. But, you know, uh, it, it's a pretty comfortable level of debt that they have. So they've got a strong balance sheet. And when you buy this stock with 33% discount or intrinsic value, it has a huge margin of safety built in. What that really implies is that if this stock could fall by 30%, your principal would still be protected. And that is assuming your valuation of intrinsic value is somewhat accurate. You don't have to be exactly right. And, you know, so this stock is high quality. It's got a safe balance sheet and we bought it for cheap. And what we think will happen over time is, you know, the blue line that you see, the intrinsic value, we believe it's 240 around that region, 240, And uh, we built that position at 140, obviously. And um, what we hope is that over time, stock price, now of course, the blue extension that you see here, it's probably not gonna happen that way, but it is something that we expect to happen over time. That 140 eventually will uh, intersect, the market price will intersect with that blue line and that will be your return, right? So I don't know what the stock price is today, but you know, it has moved since. But that's sort of uh, how you can uh, think about you know the stock market so you know that will be the end of the presentation and uh, more than happy to take any questions so thank you so much said for having that amazing presentation very very informative um so yeah any questions? We actually had one a little bit earlier. It's not related directly to value investing per se. Um, it was Annie who 
she said, does Bitcoin have intrinsic value? And if you guys want, um, we'd be more than happy to um, have you guys put on your screens to engage with Sid and, um, you know, ask whatever questions you want. So feel free to address yeah. the and cameras. To address that question, right? Um, Bitcoin is a tricky one. I personally do not think there's any value there because why is Bitcoin 100,000, right? Or 50,000 now? Why would it be a million dollars in the future? You have to ask that question to yourself. And, you know, what is so special about Bitcoin? Well, the technology blockchain, which is really, you know, uh, a more like a, you know, it's an anonymous way to transfer money. And it's got checks and balances that makes, uh, you know, sort of uh, corrupting that data or whatever you're transferring very difficult because of, you know, I mean, blockchain is really, you get a bunch of blocks with each individual signatures in sequence. And that signature gets, you know, when you mine a Bitcoin, essentially that's, you solve that problem, you create that unique signature. And if it doesn't get verified, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it's not possible for you to break into the chain. Uh, it's a way, you know, simplistic uh, view of blockchain, but that's essentially what it is. And blockchain has a lot of applications, right? If you're buying, let's say, fashion bags or, you know, any, you know, anything that you want something that was made originally in Paris by, you know, that's a Louis Vuitton, and it, you don't know if this is an actual original or is this a copy. In those cases, blockchain has value uh, as a technology. Bitcoin, to me, is really like a digital credit card. And when you say Bitcoin itself is, is worth like, you know, whatever, 50,000, uh, you're really making... I mean, at least according, in my view, the claim that the plastic credit cards or debit cards themselves have value of thousands of dollars, right? Um, so it has some intrinsic value maybe, but 50,000, um, the too many cryptocurrencies out there, you can start your own pretty easily. Uh, you've got doggy coin and you know, kinds of things. So, What's so special about Bitcoin, right? Uh, it's not rare. It's rare as in you cannot produce unlimited Bitcoin maybe, but you can produce unlimited cryptocurrencies. So uh, it's a tricky one according to me, I think. Yeah. I can't really put a value on it. So probably a speculative problem. Thank you for that question. And Sid, thank you for that really, really um, great insight. I know Anosh also has a question. Um, Anosh, if you want to turn on your mic or camera. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sid. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Again, I'm very blank in this space. Uh, this is not something that I've really dealt with or gone more into. So just wanting to know if for somebody who really doesn't have this kind of a background, but wants to start investing in stocks, how, how do you really go about it maybe at this stage or what exactly, where do you look for it? How exactly do you find out which ones are the best ones? Because I know everybody always goes for the bigger companies or seeing, you know, what's more valuable in terms of stocks, but how would you suggest somebody about it when they don't have much knowledge of it? Um, so I would say I would want against getting into uh, the stock market without having um at least, you know, a good four or five years of experience in my view, because um, it is a, you know, special field, right? And um, you do want some knowledge of what businesses you own. And it's very difficult to, you know, beat the market as you guys would know. So um, I would say, get the knowledge first. Now, if you're talking about how do you start investments, right? That's a different question. Um, 
we typically have filters as I just talked about, and they allow us to have a universe of stocks that are cheap, high quality, and uh, you know, safe. You know, got a strong balance sheet, and we take it from there and we verify if you know our assumptions about the stock are true or not. So we use screens and um, we adjust parameters on, on those screens depending on what our opportunity costs are, right? How aggressive can we go? Um, but investing, if, if you want to get started, I would say uh, start with uh, the classics, you know, Security Analysis, Benjamin Graham. It's a great book. I think that's something you can start off with. Thanks. Any other questions? You guys can just turn on your mic and um, turn on your camera. Feel free. I said, thanks again. Um, I actually have a quick question. Um, this is kind of relating to COVID um, and what you're seeing now as, sorry, <laughs> um, as the companies that lost a lot of uh, liquidity in the past start to come back um, once the vaccine helps and companies start to come back stronger, do you think there'll be a shift away from value investing um, into growth investing? Or what are your, your thoughts on um, what the next five years are gonna look like? Well, I mean, that's a fantastic question. Because value investors, I mean, value investing is a very tricky word because the ways to go about it, you know, if you look at it, Investors like uh, Ben Graham of the O, they would just look at. If I take an example of a bakery, right? If you own a bakery, what is that bakery worth when it's dead? Or when you shut it down, you sell everything. So if you buy chimney or you know, utensils or whatever, all of those put together are worth, let's say, half a million dollars. And if you, if somebody's selling you this bakery for 300,000, you are essentially buying it for cheap. And you know, the assets themselves are worth by one, uh, yeah, half a million dollars. That is one type of investor. You just buy cheap things. What was the physical equipment, the, the location, the building itself worth? So that's one type of value investing that could be out of favor. You know, that I'm not sure that will persist in the future or not. Because we have moved to a very service heavy economy. Second type of value investing is really, you know, more in line with what we do. You know, we look at cash flows. What does the business actually make every year? And we discount that back. We get the value of that business. We turn back for cheap. Now, growth is actually part of value. So they're not two different things. If you can find a company whose value is growing over time, right? Um, you know, if I just do pull up this data, right? So, so in this example, you can see the blue line, right? Yeah, and that blue line, as you can see, is not straight. It's actually growing, or it's actually at a slope. So the intrinsic value is increasing over time as well. And those are the best kind of businesses. The high quality, the cheap, and the growth. And this business is not growing at a very rapid rate, as you can see, it's going around two, three percent. Um, but if you can find something that's growing in addition to all of that, that's growth investing and value investing combined. Um, I don't think uh, growth investing in you know, in of itself is, you know, if you were to sell, you know, a dollar bill for 99 cents, you will sell a lot of those, right? And you could possibly grow way fast doing that, your business of selling a dollar bill for 99 cents, but you will never be profitable, right? So growth uh, without any, when I talk about quality is useless right so growth investing and value investing 
to me are tied at the hip. They are sort of part of each other. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I had a question. So what's your investment horizon usually like? Because value investing is a long-term strategy, obviously. And it might take, if you like invest in an asset which you think it's undervalued, it might take years for it to reach the value or exceed the value. So what, what's your strategy over there? How long do you think it takes for you to get your money back or increase in value? And what do you do in the short term while you're waiting for your investments to reach the level you think they will? Well, um, what we do in the short run is really we do more research and we try and identify more opportunities because you can't really influence when the market will agree with you. And when I say when will the market agree with us, it's really that green line, when will that meet the blue line at that point, right? When we'll grow enough to coincide with that. We don't know how long that will take, right? I assume typically two to three years is when market efficiency kicks in. And, you know, that is what I expect on average. That's been uh, my experience of, you know, you can sort of verify yourself, but it's not a given. Could take slightly longer, could, could happen within, you know, two, three months. So we, the investment horizon also depends on if the business is growing. Right, so if I'm buying Amazon, bought it for cheap, right? Amazon was worth one trillion. I bought it for seven hundred billion, right? Just you know, you divide that by market uh, number of outstanding shares, you'll get the market price. Um, do I have to sell it once it gets to one billion? Not necessarily, because that one billion is also growing, at, you know, twenty, thirty percent. So. If the business is not growing, this blue line is flat, then there, there are no further profits to be made, right? By holding on to it. But if this blue line was growing at like 20%, um, I would keep holding on to it. Great question, Sid, and thank you. Oh, great question, Jay, and thank you so much, Sid, for that explanation. I know we have a few more questions. Um, feel free to jump on, guys. He said, I have a question. Um, well, thank you for the presentation, super insightful. Um, if there was one or whatever takeaway that you've gotten from your MBA experience and moving on to um, you know, like life outside of something like an MBA, uh, what advice would you give us as you know, students who are about to graduate or will graduate from a year uh, from now, especially of those that are looking into something like you know, private equity or finance, uh, any advice? Um. So I think the one piece of advice that really works, I think, is Arnold Schwarzenegger came up with it, was uh, work hard and advertise. So if you guys are, and you know, you could be doing anything, right? Private equity, venture capital, hedge fund, or fintech. Um, you have the work, but you have to also push it out so that people are aware of that work. And you can't just, market you also have to have the work so yeah my advice would be to work hard and advertise you know if you can do it through networking or multiple ways to work um so sid and paul make a great team paul is also like a master networker and sid is like the brain so it's i think sid is also a great example of picking the an awesome co-founder as well, right? And really merging two talents um, to build a brand and a team because you can't build a company alone. So I feel like Sid and Paul really are a great example of that. I actually have a question of my own, Sid, if I um, don't mind, if you don't mind me asking. Um, right now, economically, we're not producing much. Our economy is I don't think it's ever produced this little, right? And we just printed, I think, the most money we've ever produced in, um, ever in American history. How do you think that's going to affect the, um, the markets moving forward, especially in the coming months um, and 
you know, what can we expect? What are you seeing? Well, so I think the one thing that wasn't in the presentation was anything on macro, right? Interest rates, exchange rates, uh, inflation, all those things. You want to be macro really plays no part in what we do, mainly because it's unpredictable, right? Nobody predicted that, could have predicted that you could have 10 years of like rock bottom interest rates with no inflation, even after printing so much money. And people haven't been able to explain that. Uh, best economists disagree with each other. So it's not a settled science, right, macro. So the best cannot do it, fortunately. My assumption would be, you know, and this could be completely, you know, ridiculous. The reality could be completely different. I think you're going to have you know, normalized interest rates, 4-5%. Inflation of around maybe 4 5% as well. Uh, you might see the market. Uh, it might tumble. I'm not sure how it will happen, when it will happen, but it could decline by as much as 30 to 50%. And, you know, with the U.S. deficits as a stand, I'm not sure how that problem will be solved. I most likely think U.S. will inflate away its debt. So I don't think there's any structural problem apart from that debt. That, that is a big one. But U.S. should do fine over long periods of time, as you just saw. And in that graph, 1957 to 2016, I think it was. So, you know, you know, economic downturns are inevitable. It will happen at some point in time. There will be a market crash. We don't know when exactly or how. But that's my expectation for it. And high inflation would be low. Thank you for that. Hey, Sid, I, I just had a quick question. Um, really like the presentation and thank you so much for you know being here. Um, I was interested to learn where you do your research, like any publications or news sources you like, or where do you typically go to find um, your information? Um, I think there's a good resource called Value Investors Club. It's a forum where you can find a lot of great uh, Investment ideas, probably the, the best one of its kind. Other is some zero, uh, which is also pretty good. And um, But typically, you can't really look at, unless you know the investor, right? So if you know, let's say Mr. Buffett made a position in this company, there's a good reason behind that, and you can try deconstructing that. Um, but you know it's Mr. Buffett, right? So you can look at holdings of other great investors out there and you can clone that, right? Sometimes you won't be able to figure out, you know, why he made that position. But other times, you know, you can, especially with other value investors, uh, construct that position. Right? So it's a good way to generate ideas. But I think mostly it's not going to be useful for you if you're, if you're a small capital base. You should look at smaller market caps, right, if you're looking at personal investments, um, which the big investors wouldn't touch because it's not going to, you know, they go up by 20 times, so I'm going to make a dent on the portfolio. It's not worth the time. So apart from those two resources, reading through the holdings of the great investors, um, Wall Street Journal is good, right? Wall Street Journal for microeconomic stuff. Yeah. Paid publications of, you know, now it has Wall Journal, all of those. Great, thank you. Um, hi, Sadat. I had a quick question. Thank you, firstly, for the presentation. Um, when we look at value investing, how important does diversification play a role? Because if we look for the best 15 stocks, then uh, can it be in maybe two or three sectors, or, or do we diversify into multiple sectors? That's an incredible question, because um, think about it. I mean, you're right. You need at least some diversification. You don't want to own, let's say, 10 airline stocks, right? They would have gotten decimated during COVID. 
permanent decimated. Um, so you want, I would say, four to five industries, six industries, right? And uh, really high quality businesses with strong balance sheets. So something will go wrong, something that you cannot predict will happen, like COVID. And uh, if you have all the money in one sector, one type of company, it, you could buy out to well very quickly. So there's no uh, it's not before. I mean, if you have let's say semiconductor company, auto company, tech company, restaurant uh, chain, and let's say one other type of business, laundromat chain or something like that, then I think your stuff shouldn't be well diversified, right? Less correlated the businesses, the better. But yeah, the important point would be to not go over 20, 25 stocks. Because when you demand high quality, right? When you talk about the filters, very few companies will match that criteria, right? And um, you cannot dilute your, you cannot have 60 stocks and you put half a percentage each or something like that, these stocks, you know, that, you're not gonna, you're just better off owning the index in that case. So if you're looking to beat the market, you have to be concentrated. 20 great businesses are more than enough. Like, uh, great investor, Bill Ackman owns, I think, eight to 10 positions. And he's managing, uh, I think, in excess of 10 billion now. So that's, you know, that's a lot of, that's as much diversification as you need. Thank you. We do have a question from James Lee. Um, if you do want to turn on your mic, James, and ask. Okay, um, seems like there's a bit of a delay. But he asked, have you looked at Chinese stocks and found any interesting value opportunities? Um, unfortunately, we don't look at China. You know, our focus is India, mainly, and the US. So I can't really give you anything. I'm sure there are great companies there that you can look into, but I don't have the expertise in that region. Thanks, Sid, and thanks, James, for the question. So guys, any more questions? Okay, so I'm gonna let Jay take it away from here. Thank you, Sid, for coming here today and are talking to us about value investing. I, I feel it's like a topic no one really talks about much these days. Everyone wants quick returns. They want to short something. They want to quick, get quick, uh, quick money. And I think this was really interesting and I would be looking into it even more. But on behalf of PVC and the facts from uh, Fordham, we thank you so much for coming here today, taking the time out. And it's always good to hear from someone young and a Fordham alumni as it gives you more hope to find a job, to do something better. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. And thank you, Avneet, for putting together the event. Thank you. Of course, thank you, Sid. Everybody, please give him a round of applause. We applause. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you guys so much. And thank you. Bye-bye. Have you all have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>